Hello, I'm Patty Simpson with Simpson Math. Let's talk about the Poisson distribution. The Poisson distribution is another discrete probability distribution that tells us the probability that an event occurs in a certain time or area or volume. So Poisson distribution um, gives us that probability over time, area, and volume. And there are certain prob um, conditions that must be met in order for it to be a Poisson distribution. Um, in order for it to be Poisson, the events must occur independent of one another. Each one must be independent, completely independent. Just because one happens doesn't mean that we know another one's going to happen. They're completely independent of one another. And the probability of each event occurs the same over that area of time, um, area, or volume. In other words, that it is going to be a random event. So they are random independent events that happen in a specific time frame or in a certain area or in a certain volume. Then one of the uh, characteristics of that Poisson then will be that the mean is approximately equal to the variance. The mean and the variance are about the same in a Poisson distribution. Now notice that it is a discrete distribution. So just like we've been studying, uh, the Poisson variable uh, takes on a discrete um, value. In other words, our x values are going to be 0, 1, 2, 3, those nice discrete um, uh, numbers. But in this case, the, the number of events that occur are not fixed. Remember with binomial and with hypergeometric, the number of trials or the number of events was fixed. With Poisson, that's not true. It could go on and on forever. We could have a thousand of them. We could have a million events that occur. So it's, there's no fixed amount of events that occur within a Poisson distribution. Um, but the events do occur independently and that probability does remain the same. So there's a little introduction to the Poisson distribution. Let's look at the formula for the Poisson distribution. Now, the Poisson distribution is a discrete distribution that shows the probability that an event occurs over a specific time or area or volume. And this formula is going to give us those, ver those um, probabilities. So here we have um, the probability that our um, event occurs, that our um, number of um, events occurs is equal to, this symbol is a Greek letter lambda, we'll talk more about it in a minute, lambda raised to that x value times e raised to the negative lambda, all divided by x factorial. So let's talk about this for just a minute. This lambda, that Greek letter lambda, represents the average number of occurrences. So when you look on the internet at the Poisson formula, we, it shows up with this lambda symbol. But to me, that seems a little silly because we already have a symbol for average number. We already have a symbol for that. Our symbol is mu. So when I talk about this Poisson distribution, I like to just use that mu that we already have. So I'm just gonna replace all the lambdas in this formula with mu because they're the same thing, the average number raised to our number of successes um, or the variable we're looking for. Then um, E we'll talk about in just a second to the negative mu, raised to the negative mu, all over x factorial. Now this negative exponent means that it's one over that number or if you remember from algebra, what it does is it just flips that to the bottom. This here is the same as saying mu to the x over that negative exponent just moves this down to the bottom and then the negative goes away. 
So in my opinion, it's just easier to think about if we just get rid of that negative exponent altogether. So if you look on the internet, if you look out in different textbooks, they always have it written like this. But to me, the formula is just easier for me to remember and easier to me, for me to deal with if I write it in this form, where we have our average number of occurrences raised to our x is just the number of successes that we're looking for, all over the x factorial times uh, this e, let's talk about e here in a second, Euler's number, raised to the mu, raised to that average. So e is a, an irrational number. Um, everybody knows his cousin pi. Everybody knows pi. You grow up learning about pi. So pi is just a rash, irrational number, you know, 3.14, and it goes on and on and on forever and ever. Well, e is similar to that. It too is an irrational number. And that irrational number looks something like this. It's 2.71828. And then it goes on and on and on and on forever and ever and ever. So this is a, a number. That E represents a number, just like the pi symbol represents a number. Those two are just irrational numbers that show up in nature. Pi with circles and E shows up, especially with finance, when we compound interest uh, continuously. Euler's number there shows up over and over and over again. We use it a lot with logarithms in um, college algebra and other math. So, and it shows up in finance quite a bit. So here, um, that Euler's number, that E, is just going to be here on the bottom, that 2.71-ish approximation um, raised to the average. Now, when I say that um, I wanted an exact form, then we're just going to leave that letter E because we can't write down the exact number because it goes on and on and on forever. If, however, I ask you to approximate, then in that case, we're just going to make it 2.7. That's a good approximation of our E. So here is the formula that we're going to use when we're dealing with our um, Poisson distribution. A couple of characteristics that we need to know about this Poisson distribution is that the mean is approximately the same as the variance. So in some of our problems, we'll be given the mean which is our lambda or our mu for our formula. But in some of the problems, we'll just be given our variance. So just remember that the variance and the mean are approximately the same. So if you're given the variance, then in that case, that will be your lambda or your mu. Because of that, remember that your variance is your standard deviation squared. This is your variance. So when we talk later about the standard deviation of a Poisson, the standard deviation of a Poisson is just the square root of your variance. But since the variance is approximately the same as your mean, then your square root is approximately, I mean, your standard deviation is approximately the same as your, the square root of your mean. So that's just something to keep in, line, uh, in mind later as we talk about the standard deviation of these Poisson distributions. So let's look at um, some examples where we actually use the formula, but here is the Poisson formula. Let's look at the Poisson distribution and use the formula to help us to solve an example. So remember that we've looked at the formula here of the Poisson distribution. We saw that if we look on the internet or in books, we'll probably see it in this form, but we kind of like it in this form where we just say that our lambda is the same as the average, so we're just going to use our mu for that lambda. And then x is the number of successes, um, and then e is Euler's number there where it's approximately that irrational number that's approximately 2.5. 7, 1, 8, 2, 8, 1, 8, 2, 8, 45, 90, 45, forever and ever and ever. It just goes on and on and on. So that's that irrational number. And so we have um, that average raised to our number of successes over the number of successes factorial 
times um, e raised to the average number. So here's an example of that. The mean number of accidents per month at a certain intersection is three. What is the probability that in any given month, four accidents will occur at the intersection? Now, let's just check to make sure that it makes sense that this is a Poisson distribution. Remember that in order for it to be Poisson, the events have to be independent. So in other words, each one of the accidents is an, an independent event. And then the probability that that occurs is a, a nice random um, event. It's a, a randomly occurring event that's happening independently. And that happens at, with accidents at intersections. Then it is a discrete value. In other words, the number of accidents that we ha have occur at that intersection, we can count. It could be zero accidents or one accident or two accidents. So our Poisson variable is the number of accidents. Our X values could take on these values. Could be zero accidents or one accident or two accidents or three accidents or four accidents forever and ever. There's no fixed number like we had with our binomial or our hypergeometric. This just continues to go on forever and ever. So if we were making a probability distribution, we would have our random variable on one side and then the probability on the other. So in this case, we're looking though at the probability that we have exactly four accidents within the month. So we're looking for that probability of four accidents within the month. So we're gonna use our Poisson distribution formula there to help us out. Really, we only have two things that we need. We need our average and the, the number of accidents that we're looking for, that number of those events. So in this case, our average is three, the mean number is three, and our number of successes or the number of events we're looking for is four. Now I'm just gonna take that and plug it in or substitute it into my formula. So I'm looking for when my x value equals four. The way I remember this formula is uh, the x and the mu are both on the top and on the bottom. There's one of each on the top and on the bottom. Then they kind of swap places in that there's the x is an exponent up here and the mu's a base, and down on the bottom, the mu is an exponent where the x is a base, so they kind of swap um, places. Then that helps me remember where all the values go. All I have to remember then is that x factorial. x is the one that's factorial. So I have that x factorial on bottom, then e raised to my average of three. Then since the mu was the um, exponent here, I know my x is gonna be the exponent there, and this is gonna be the base. Now I'm just gonna do a little arithmetic. Three to the fourth power just means three times three times three times three. And four factorial, remember, is four times three times two times one. Then I have e to the third power. Now, the threes, I'm gonna go ahead and simplify before I multiply, so I don't have to simplify later. This three and that three can, can reduce. They become one. So then I just have on top three times three times three. Well, three times three is nine times three is 27. Four times two is eight times one is still eight times that e cubed. This is the exact form of that probability. The minute I change my e into any number, I'm then approximating. So if in the question it asks you to give the answer in exact form, this is the exact form. We leave the e as an e when we're in exact form. But if I ask you to approximate it, then we're gonna take that e and we're gonna say, well, it's approximately 2.7. 
So E is approximately 2.7, 2 and 7 tenths. And cubed means I have three of those. So I would just use my calculator at that point to figure out about how much that is. So in my calculator, I would type 27. I would divide that by 8. And then I would divide again my answer by 2.7. And then I would divide again my answer by 2.7. And I would divide again by 2.7. So if I were using my calculator, I would type 27 divided by 8, divided by 2.7, divided by 2.7, divided by 2.7. And I should get approximately um, 17 hundredths or about 0.1714, which is about, remember when we talk about percentages, that's about 17% of the time we would expect to have, um, approximately 17% of the time we would expect to have four accidents happen within a given month. That's the probability that four accidents will happen at that intersection. So there we've used the Poisson formula to help us to find that probability over a certain amount of time that month. I'm going to change the wording just a little bit in this problem and then um, see how that affects things. So instead of looking that in any given month we have four accidents, instead of that four, I'm going to change it to at least two. At least two two accidents that occur in any given month. So I'm going to look at that at my random um, variables and let's see if we can figure out how to find the probability that at least two of them occur. Remember that wording of at least two can be tricky, but I always like to think of it in terms of if the doctor tells me I can have at least two um, medicines or at least put at least two bandages on there, that means two or three or four or five. You know, drink at least two bottles of water means you're drinking two or three or four or five or six forever and ever out there. So it's two or more. This at least two means two or more. So if I look at my probability distribution here, it's this, you know, I'm looking at two or more. And we've seen before, in order to find that probability, we would have to find the probability of two, find the probability of three, find the probability of four, find the probability of five, pro find the probability of six, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then once we found all those probabilities, add them together. But in this case, we can't find all those probabilities because it goes on forever and ever. So we can't find all the probabilities. This is a situation where we are going to have to use our complement. Notice the two that are not part of that set are the zero and the one. So this zero and one are the complement to at least two. Less than two is the complement to at least two. So if we find the probability, in order to find the probability of at least two, this says two or more, that equal two means it's equal to two, and then this is greater than, the alligator's eating the bigger number, so it's greater than or equal to two. In order to find that probability, I'm gonna use the complement. I'm gonna take the whole set, Remember, they all add up to be 100% or they all add up to be 1. And I'm going to subtract off the probability of 0 plus the probability of 1. So I'm going to find these two probabilities, add them together, and then subtract it off. And that's going to give me this set, that probability that it's at least 2. So I have to change things a little bit. I now have two different problems I'm going to do. I'm going to find the probability of zero and I'm going to find the probability of one and I'm going to add those together. So my mu changes, 
by mu is still three, actually, it does not change. The, the, in, the average within the problems is still three. It's just my number of successes now changes. First, I'm gonna find zero. So I'm just gonna to come to each one of the places where I had an X of four, and I'm gonna change that to a zero. Then I'm gonna erase all this so that I can find the probability of zero. And the probability of zero, well, any number raised to the zero power, any non-zero number raised to the zero power is equal to one. So anytime we raise it to the zero power, we're looking at one there. And we know that zero factorial is defined as one. So we have one over one times e cubed, which is just one over e cubed. So that's our probability that x equals zero. Now, let's find the probability that x equals one. Well, in order to find the probability that x equals one, our mu stays three, but in this case, my x is gonna be one. So just everywhere I had an x value there of zero, I'm gonna change it into a one. So three to the uh, first power is just three. Um, and then one factorial is one. So then three over one times e cubed is just three over e cubed. Now, I'm gonna take those two values and I'm gonna add them together. My one over e cubed plus my th um, three over e cubed. So the probability of zero plus the probability of one is just equal to one over e cubed plus three over e cubed. We have a common denominator, so we can add these fractions. Remember with the common denominator, we just keep that common denominator. We don't add our denominators. And then I just add my numerator. Three plus one is four. Now, I'm gonna take that value and I'm gonna subtract it from one to find the prob probability of at least two. So now I have one minus the four over e cubed. Remember, I can change one. I have to find a common denominator in order to subtract them. So I can rewrite this one as e cubed over e cubed. I keep my denominator to be e cubed, but my numerator, I'm gonna have to leave. These two guys are not nice to add together. They're not um, like terms there. That e cubed minus four, I'm gonna leave it like this for my exact form. So here it is in exact form that probability. It doesn't mean a lot to us though in this form. So now I'm gonna give an approximation of that. So in my calculator, I would put in 2.7 cubed and I would subtract four from that. And you should get something if you do 2.7 cubed minus four, you should get about 15.683-ish. Um, and then on the bottom, that e cubed, or that 2.7 cubed, is about 19, it's about 19, about 20, 19.683, about that much. And then if you do that division, you should get about 80%. So about 80% of the time, we're gonna get at least, we're gonna have at least two accidents at that intersection. So here's where I have to use that complement when I'm dealing with the Poisson because we do not have a fixed number of trials. So if I'm looking at something like, what's the probability I have more than two accidents at that um, intersection? Or I have at least five accidents at that intersection. I have to use the, the complement in order to find that. So there's just an example or two of using the Poisson formula to help us to solve 
for the probability of a Poisson distribution. Let's look at another example of a Poisson distribution. And let's find the probability that something occurs using the Poisson formula. So here we have a population count shows that the average number of rabbits per acre living in a field is four. We want to find the probability that seven rabbits are found in any given acre of the field. So notice that each one of these rabbits that occurs is an independent event, and it's a random probability. There is a random independent event there, and it's over a area. So that's what makes this a Poisson distribution. And then it's a discrete variable. In other words, we can count the number of rabbits that are on the field. We could have zero rabbits, one rabbit, two rabbit. So our Poisson variable is the number of rabbits, and those are discrete. So we're going to use this um, formula, Poisson's formula, to help us to find that probability that there are exactly seven rabbits in any given field. So we need two, uh, two values, we need our average, and we need the number of successes, the number of rabbits that we're looking for, um, in order to put them into our formula, to substitute them in. The average here on our question it tells us that the average number is four. So our mu here is four, and our x value, the number of successes we're looking for, is excuse me, is seven. We're looking for seven um, rabbits. So now I'm just going to substitute those into my formula. So the probability for success is seven. And I put that x value, that factorial down on the bottom, times e raised to my mu, which is four. Then these guys kind of swap places so that my seven becomes an exponent and my four becomes a base. Now I'm just gonna do a little arithmetic with that so that I have four times four, seven times. So that's four, five, six, seven. And on bottom I have seven times six times five times four times three times two times one. And I know you're at home using a calculator, but let's pretend that we're not using a calculator. And when we're in class, we're not using a calculator. Then let's simplify this anyway to begin with, just so that we don't have to uh, simplify at the end, get some big number and have to divide it down. Notice there's a four on top and a four on bottom. I can simplify any of those, that becomes one. I can do some more simplification because two goes into four two times. So this two and that four. Then also six has a factor of two in it. So I can divide a two in that six and I can divide this two or another two from one of the fours, whichever. I'll go ahead and do it from that two. And that leaves me on bottom with a three. So I have here one, two, three, four, five fours left. And on bottom, I have seven times three times five times three times one times e to the fourth. Now I can do a little bit of arithmetic. Four times four is 16. Four times four is 16. So I really have 16 times 16 times four. And here I've got um, uh, seven times, I'm gonna make this a nine times five, just to make it a little easier on myself. Then I know 16 times 16 is 256 times four, one of those nice perfect squares. And then 63 times five down here on the bottom. So uh, 256 times four, well that's 24, carrier two, 20, put down that two, carrier two, eight, nine, 10, so that's 1,240. And then on bottom, we've got 63 times five. Well, five times three is, six, is 15, carry one. Five times um, six is 30, with that one is 31, or 315. Here I have the probability in exact form. So again, if I ask for the answer in exact form, you just leave it just like that. We know it's simplified, 
because we did the simplification early. We don't have to worry about simplifying now, we've already done it. But if I ask for it in an approximation, then we're gonna use our calculator and we're gonna substitute in for that E approximately 2.7. So there we have it in exact form. If I ask you to leave it in exact form, you're gonna leave it like that. But that doesn't make a lot of sense um, for us, if we're actually looking for the probability, we want to, uh, what does that mean? Well, we might find the approximation for it. Remember when we're finding the approximation for it, what we do is we take this E and we say it's about 2.7. So you, you take, I would just put into my calculator 1024 divided by 315 divided by 2.7 divided by 2.7 divided by 2.7, divided by 2.7. And we should get out about, about 6%, six hundredths, which remember is 6%. So about 6% of the time, we would expect to find seven rabbits in our acre, in our field. So there's another example of us using that Poisson formula to help us solve a Poisson distribution problem. Let's look at a Poisson distribution probability problem. So here, on a particular river, floods occur once every 100 years on average. We're gonna calculate the probability of the river flooding four times in a 100 year period. So here we have um, the number of times the river floods is our variable, and that's a discrete variable. It, we can count one, two, three, zero times the um, river floods. And then um, it happens at a certain, um, over a certain um, time period and a certain area. And the events are independent and they happen randomly. So that's what makes this fit a Poisson um, distribution. So we're gonna use this Poisson formula to help us to solve this problem. We only need two things to substitute into our formula. We need to substitute in our average, and then we also need to substitute in our um, number of occurrences that we're looking for there. So here on average, it occurs once on average every 100 years. So our average is that one time. If we were looking at the um, number of times in say a thousand year period, then all of a sudden our average would be 10. So we do have to be careful with the wording of our problems there. And then the number of successes or the number of um, events that we're looking for is four. So our X here is four. We're gonna substitute this in to our um, formula. So we have the probability of um, that x equals 4. And now we just take and substitute in. We remember that our x is on bottom, that factorial, with e raised to our mean. And then our x and our mu just swap places up on top. So since this was an um, exponent down on bottom, I know it's going to be the base on top. And this is going to be the exponent on top. So I have 1 to the fourth power, which is still just 1 over 4 factorial, remember, is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and e to the first power is just 1. Do my multiplication, 4 times 3 is 12, times 2 is 24, times 1 is still 24. So there it is in our exact form. So if I ask for the answer in exact form, we just leave it with as 1 over 24 um, e times e there. But if we wanted to approximate it, then we're going to make this E 2.7, because E is approximately 2.7. So then we just put into our calculator 1 divided by 24 divided by 2.7, and we should get out about 0.015-ish, um, uh, which is about 1.5% of the time. We would expect there to be four floods on this river in that 100 year period. 
Well, what if um, we wanted to know, I'm gonna change this question just a little bit. What if instead of wanting to know um, what the probability of the river flooding four times is, instead, what if we wanted to know at least one time? What's the probability it floods at least one time? Well, in that case, my x value is going to change. So first, let's look at the distribution that would be our probability distribution. So our x values, what can they take on? Well, the, flood, the river could flood zero times, or the river could flood one time, or two times, or three times, or four times. And this just goes on and on and on forever. And we want to know what's the probability of at least one. Remember that at least one means one or more. So that means we're looking for these probabilities. One, two, three, four, and forever and ever. So we would have to find the probability of one and add it to the probability of two and add it to the probability of three. We would do this all day and still not be done because this goes on, on and on forever. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to find the probability of zero. And we're going to subtract that from one. We're going to use that complement to help us find the probability of at least one. So the probability of that x is at least one is one minus, use your complement, one minus the probability of zero. Notice that the zero is not part of the set. So if I find this probability and I subtract it from the whole set, then I'll know this probability. So the probability of zero, well, I just put in zero everywhere there was a four before. So I have one to the zero power, zero factorial, e to the first power. Any non-zero number raised to the zero power is equal to one. So any, any time we're raising it to the zero power, it's just equal to one. And zero factorial is just one. So one times e to the first power is just e. So the probability that it happens zero times, that there are zero floods, is one over e. Again, that is my exact answer. I can't, you know, we can't write this number any more exact, so I have to just leave it as that E to show what that means. But that leaves us, um, it makes it a little hard to interpret that way. So we'll, we will, um, well, first let's find the, the exact form of that probability. So we're still looking for the probability that X is at least one. So I'm gonna do one minus the probability of zero was um, one over E. I kind of lost some notation there. I should have had that one minus there and the one minus there in order for those all to be equal. So remember when we're subtracting, we need a, a common denominator. So I'm gonna turn that one into E over E. I keep my denominator and my numerator is E minus one. So there it is in exact form. That's the probability that we get at least one flood on that river. But again, that's hard to interpret. So let's find an approximation of it. And in order to find an approximation of it, we're just gonna um, uh, say that E is about 2.7. So we have 2.7 minus one, which would give us 1.7. Divide that by 2.7, and we get about, about 0.63 or about 63% of the time we're going to get at least one at least one flood 63% of the time which means that 47% of the time you get um, zero floods thereabouts so just using that Poisson distribution now there's one other thing that we can tell from the Poisson form uh, distribution. Let's change this just a little bit. And let me ask you this question. I want to know about 75% of the time, how many floods would we expect to have? So remember that we could use Chebyshev's to help us to determine that. Remember within Chebyshev's, we know that um, 
75% of our data falls within uh, two standard deviations from our mean. So if we could figure out the standard deviation of this Poisson distribution, then we could start to figure out where 75% of our data would fall. And it just so happens that in Poisson distributions that our um, standard deviation is equal to the square root of our mean because our mean is about the same as our variance. So our mean and our variance are about the same. So that can help us to find then the square, the standard deviation, because we know that the standard deviation is just the square root of that variance. Our standard deviation, which is that sigma, is equal to the square root of our variance. But our variance is about the same as our mean. So we can find the standard deviation just by substituting in there our mean. In this case, the square root of one is equal to one. So our standard deviation is about one. So then we can say, well, I know that 75% of the time then that my mean on average, there's one flood. If I go out one standard deviation, I'm at two, two standard deviations, I'm at three. If I go backwards one standard deviation, I'm at zero, backwards another, negative one, that doesn't really make sense. We can't have a negative one flood. But my data, if I'm recording every 100 years how many floods there are, 75% of my data would be between negative one and three. And then remember from Chevy Chev's that 88.9% of my data would fall between then, uh, would be out three standard deviations. So between negative two and four. So if I have five floods on this river, I know that that's an unusual event. If I have more than four, you know, it's outside of that 88% of the time it should fall within this. So that's a weird thing that's happening. And then I can begin to ask myself why. So if, if within 100 years I have five floods on the river, I can go, wow, that's a weird thing. That probability that that happens is rare. I wonder why it's flooding. Maybe the, the um, path of the river has changed. Or maybe humans have built things in the way of that river. And so now it's flooding more. Or maybe we got more rain and that caused it to flood more often. What is it that's causing that unprobable event to occur? So we can use um, ideas like that, Chevy Chev's theorem, uh, along with our probabilities to help us to look at our um, world and go, wow, that's a really weird thing that's happening. I wonder what's causing that. So there's just another example of our Poisson distribution and using that formula to solve for probabilities. Let's look at how we can tell the difference between the three discrete distributions that we've looked at, binomial distribution, hypergeometric, and Poisson. So all three uh, of those distributions have a discrete variable. In other words, the variable takes on the value of zero, one, two, three. It's countable. So with a binomial, and all three of the distributions have two outcomes. You have a success or a failure, uh, you, two different outcomes. So how do we know the difference or when to use with each one? With a binomial, there's a fixed number of trials each time. There's a fixed number of patients we're looking at, fixed number of times we're rolling the dice, fixed number of times we're spinning the spinner, a, a set number of times. And the probability for binomial always remains the same. So maybe the patient has a 30% chance of being cured, or the plant has a 10% chance of growing, or on a dice, it's always one out of six chance that I get a certain number. That probability stays the same. Or you could think with replacement, for binomial. Now that's different from a hypergeometric. 
with the hypergeometric, you also have a fixed number of trials so that you, again, are doing something three times or you're looking at a set number of people. But the probability here does not remain the same. It changes. The first event or the second event is dependent upon the other event. Or you could think without replacement, if I'm pulling from a group and not replacing. So the probability does not remain the same. So that's how we can tell the difference between binomial and hypergeometric. Binomial, the probability is the same. Hypergeometric, the probability um, changes. It's without replacement. Then with the Poisson, there is no fixed number of trials. We can have um, an infinite number of times something happened. Maybe that's not likely, but it could. Um, uh, there's no fixed number of trials. Also with Poisson, you're, the mean and the variance are approximately equal. So in the problem, you're going to be given either the mean or the variance. You're going to know that mean or variance. And then also Poisson, we're looking at a probability within a certain time frame or within a certain specific area or volume. So Poisson is always dealing with time, area, and volume. So that's kind of how we can tell the difference between each of the dis discrete distributions that we've looked at um, here over the last little bit. Math made simple at Simpson Math. Thanks for watching.